Unscripted. PTC's Unscripted series brings playwrights, audiences, and the imagination together. Playwrights Theatre Center PTC is a theatre company that finds, nurtures, and advances creators of vision and passion, supporting new plays from creation to performance. New and necessary stories take shape. Fresh ways of working, thinking, and creating emerge. Yellow Objects Synopsis Hong Kong 2050 a young woman meets an old man in an abandoned school and discovers a history beyond her wildest dreams or nightmares. What is a responsibility to future generations? If changing the past might change the future, how far would you go? Join us in the conversation. We want to hear from you live. Let us know what you think about unscripted yellow objects. Download the Telegram Messenger app and follow the instructions on unscripted yellow objects side door page or participate on our Vimeo chat during the stream. You'll also have a chance to complete a survey we'll send after the show. Thank you to Halemia Sparrow, Musqueam Nation, for acknowledging the land and welcoming us tonight. and the Halemia, Musqueam. Good evening, everyone. My name is Halemia Sparrow, and I am from the Musqueam Nation. I am so um, grateful to be here this evening to share a land acknowledgement with you. Uh, and for me, that can mean many things. Uh, the purpose for me behind uh, land acknowledgements is not to just share with you uh, by rote that we are on the unceded territory of the Humafquiam Squamish and slave to people. While that's very important to state, um, by Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people alike, with land acknowledgements, for me it's very important to embody a cultural protocol. And I do my very best to do that in the way that I know how, in the way that I feel comfortable doing so, has been my exploration through our canoeing that I've been learning over the past uh, many years uh, from teachers such as Bob Baker and um, some canoe teachers from the Muslim Nation as well. And through that, I've started to incorporate protocol and canoe teachings with my openings and my land acknowledgments. And the reason for that is, is because um, the waterways were our highways on this on our traditional territory, and uh, we traveled around. We had very intricate um, connections with all of the nations and agreements, and that's why it's so difficult right now for non-indigenous people to understand. You know, they're always saying, "Well, whose territory is this?" and for us, it was a very detailed agreement. My name, Holemia, it comes from upriver, from my grandmother's family. She married into Kumakuyam, uh, my grandfather's family. And we kept track of things in a very particular way. You know, if you heard the name Holemia, you would know exactly what family I came from. Um, my sister's name, uh, Spafia, comes from my grandfather's side of the family. And so we, we were very aware of this interconnectedness and the interconnectedness with the land where sometimes someone would be there, uh, have their uh, winter village there or their summer village there or there would be shared territories where people will come and share their resources. But there was an understanding between the nations. 
And one of the protocols and ways that we um, enacted this was when you arrive in your commute. And even when you arrive on your commute to a nation or a territory, uh, before you get out of the canoe, you stay in the water and you state your intention for being there. You know, is, are you there for a feast? Are you there uh, to hunt or fish? Uh, are you there for negotiation? What is your purpose for being on that land and being that specific territory? You know, um, so I like to bring that protocol into events such as this, and also if events that I feel drawn to that I feel are important work. And I feel that, like this event tonight is incredible, incredible, important work that's happening. And so um, as a Muslim woman, but more importantly, individually as well too, because I, I'm always representing my community, but individually I show up and I'm drawn to support certain projects, and I feel like this project is so incredibly meaningful and important that as a Muslim woman, I want to share that protocol here and support in any way that I can. And what we say in our culture too, when we start off a process, uh, we start it off in a good way. And so going back to the intention with the canoe, you arrive and you state your intention. And for this purpose, let's say for us, I like to equate these events like feasts um, or gatherings, you know, or even when you're coming together to share knowledge or to be with family or exchange ideas. This, this is what these, these events are that we're creating. When we're creating art, when we're creating a movement, when we have important things to share with the world, you know, I equate that to coming into the longhouse to begin the work, is what we say in our culture, the important work, and to do that work in a good way. And um, I really like to follow my mentor, Bob Baker's lead in this too, and I've heard him say, we're ready now. So that's my job here, is to call everyone into the space to call everyone into the longhouse. And I ask everyone here that is gathered, it's so important right now because, you know, I look at you through there and we're connecting, but we're not face to face. And so it's so important to create this connection together. And so I ask all of you that are joining us virtually to really be present, to you know, leave anything behind that you don't need for this process or to partake in this. And as my, my cousin Bob Baker says, if you have anything going on in your life <laughs> that is challenging or negative like we all do right now, it's very trying, interesting times, that this can be an opportunity to just put it aside for a second. Let it go. My, and Bob Baker always says you can like, you can pick it up as you leave. <laughs> it will still be there. <laughs> so that we create the space together. And more importantly right now, it's so important, especially with topics like this that are so important, to create joy and love as a foundation. So that we're all together holding each other in, um, in joy and gratitude and human connection. So that is a new protocol where you state your intention and then you come into the longhouse, you feast together, you leave things behind that aren't important for the work, right? Because everywhere we come together in space, we're there for a specific intention, we're there for a specific reason, and we let go of everything that we don't need so that we can focus and we can succeed in our intention. And uh, that's what I want to do here today. And so I wanted to open it up to Derek and have a connection with one another and uh, what I call a little mini protocol, which actually in my heart of hearts I keep wanting to do in these land acknowledgements with everyone that I 
that I connect with to do this work. So I'm really grateful for that. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> So we had talked about the commute protocol and stating intention, and as a representative to this land, humbly, uh, I want to be able to support you in your endeavor and what you're doing here this evening. So we can reenact our commute protocol, and I would ask you to state your intention. Hey, all. 我叫陳家龍,我是香港人,我是黃色麥見呢套劇嘅編劇同埋導演。Hi, I'm Hi. Eric Chen, and uh, I'm from Hong Kong. I'm a Hong Konger, and I'm the playwright and director of Yellow Objects. And today I come here with a message, um, with a plea almost, with a message that Hong Kong is in distress, Hong Kong needs help and Hong Kong, my home, needs attention. And I'm here to do my part, despite so far away from home, to facilitate discussions or conversations on things that we're no longer allowed to say back home anymore, things that will, will get us arrested because the Chinese government is trying to take away our voice, take away our freedom, and take away our spirit, the Hong Kong spirit. Whew, just to do that in. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, it's like, this work is very, I mean, not maybe very emotional, this work is very emotional, and uh, I thank you for stating your attention to me and uh, as a re representative of this land and understanding sovereignty and understanding um, free speech and understanding going back to the years when uh, we couldn't gather for more than five people where a potlatch was banned, where we were forced to stay on our reserves, where we couldn't, where we didn't, uh, we're not citizens and we're not able to vote, where we have been um, fighting for a struggle to be sovereign and autonomous and free on our traditional territories. And that work has been passed on from generation to generation to generation. I am here right now in my power because of my generations that came before me and all the work that they have done. And I hear you coming on these lands, needing this support and needing this space in order to speak freely, in order to express yourself order to help people from your home and your land. And as a Musqueam woman, I want to be able to support you on this land and invite you. You know, we always say when we do the land acknowledgements, people say it gets really awkward because you're, we're saying thank you retroactively. <laughs> but I want to say that this is a safe space, this land. Homakwiam, Squamish, and Slave to Find it is a safe space for you to be and for you to do your work and for you to express yourself and for you to send this message out to the world. And uh, uh, I honor you and all the work that you do and that it takes big heart to do this work. So, Haichka Oksiyam. I hear you, and uh, I do welcome you to this safe space on our territory that you live Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's really important, and um, that's very warm to hear that this is a safe space, especially reflecting on how so many people I know back home, uh, they, they don't have that privilege, they don't have that anymore for them, they have to watch every word they say, every text message, message they send, and, and that's, that's a reality that, that they're facing right now, and that's really hard to process for me. Absolutely, and, and we are in a time of, of people worldwide, you know, and more than ever, we need to recognize in each other um, our common values and goals and moving forward 
connecting and realizing that we're all one and that this earth is quite small and we only have one and that uh, we need to stand together in solidarity with important work uh, moving forward and that that doesn't that it is hard work but that there that we are powerful and we have spirit and we have our ancestors behind us and that we we have a foundation of love to do the work so I just wish you the best moving forward on your journey and like we say in our culture um, that, that you uh, are ready to embark on your good work for today. So I just thank you. <laughs> thank you everyone. Enjoy the evening. Kamusta. My name is Davy Samuel Calderon. I go by he, him pronouns. My physical appearance, I am one of Filipino descent. I'm a man. And um, currently I'm wearing a gray button up shirt and uh, dark green slacks. And welcome to Unscripted Yellow Objects with Derek Chan. Hi, I'm Derek Chan. My pronouns are he, him. Tonight, I'm wearing a light brown button-up shirt with black and white checkered, checkered pants. And uh, I am of uh, Asian descent, and I've got tattoos on both of my arms. And I'm the playwright and director of Yellow Objects. Davey speaking. So um, Derek, let's get into it. Yellow Objects is all about audiences uh, digging into your process and the questions you have about the play and development. And it has a very specific political impetus. Yes, the play began as a reflection on the Hong Kong identity, the Hong Kong spirit. Then came 2019 and the anti-extradition bill protests happened. Davy speaking again. So Derek, what's the impact of the extradition bill and what does it mean for you as a Hong Konger? The proposed 2019 extradition bill means that the Chinese government can extradite Hong Kongers to be tried under Chinese law. Under the Sino-British Joint Declaration with the UK, Hong Kongers should enjoy a high level of autonomy and be subjected to laws only in Hong Kong, not mainland China, for at least 50 years after the 1997 Hanover back to mainland Chinese rule. This is particularly important when it comes to freedom of speech, which has been less restricted in Hong Kong than in mainland China. When the Chinese government tried imposing a similar legislation back in 2003, it was met with similar significant pushback. Back then, I was too young to understand the full impact of the situation. This time around, as a Hong Konger, I feel the urge to contribute to the movement in the ways that I can and I know how, despite being half the world away. The title of the play, Yellow Objects, is a reference to a statement that a white Hong Kong police officer made during a press conference disputing video evidence showing police officers kicking a man on the ground who was wearing a yellow shirt, describing him as a yellow object. Davey here. So the current political climate in Hong Kong is one thread of yellow objects. Um, can you let audiences know other inspirations that they'll connect to in the show? Yeah. So a lot of the imagery is also inspired by things that I remember from my childhood. Mm. Stories that my grandmother told me growing up in Hong Kong, friendship, food, love, family, other memories. Times that we can never get back, perhaps. A time when everything felt like the end of the world. A time like now. Thank you, Derek. So. Tonight, we have guests who are on the front lines of the pro-Hong Kong democracy movement. We have um, designs, work in progress from yellow objects that you'll see as well. And as always, questions. And uh, also for those that are part of our Telegram chat or the Vimeo chat, we actually have two chat moderators at Howie D and at Anthony James that have some questions for you. So please answer them. Yes. So. A lot has happened in Hong Kong since 2019. The anti-extradition bill protests, clashes with the police on the streets and at university campuses, mistrust among citizens, and also government violation of human rights. It is undeniable that the Hong Kong today is not the Hong Kong that we once knew. 
To explore that, we need to talk to some people who are on the front line of the issue. Hi, I'm Derek. I'm wearing a beige button-up shirt, and I have tattoos on both of my arms. Hi, I'm Jody. Uh, I'm fully covered uh, with a baseball cap, uh, sunglasses, and fully wearing black. Hi, I'm David, and I have short hair, glasses, and wearing sweater and shirt. Hi, I'm Mac, fully covered, wrap myself up, all in black. So this is, uh, this is one for each of our panelists. What is Hong Kong to you? What do you think is happening right now? And what are some things that we can do overseas? So what's happening right now in Hong Kong to me is like um, someone just started a fire, um, started like arson um, in, my, in my house, in my room. And not only me, a lot of my friends, almost everyone I know in Hong Kong consider Hong Kong as our home. So it's like everyone's having a fire in their room. For someone like us, um, located uh, like uh, uncountable kilometers away from Hong Kong, what we can do the best is to be aware of what is happening in Hong Kong and, and, and at the same time aware of who is causing, who is starting the fire in, in our home. And that is apparently China, uh, the Communist Party there. And what we should do is to reduce our reliance on this uprising economic tycoon tyrant in, in this world right now. And that is, I, I think, the best thing that we can do at this moment. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, the, the distance is often what troubles me, uh, both, both the geographical distance and also, strangely, the proximity we, are, uh, we have to what's going on with, um, with a pretty large um, settler population here that are very closely related to Hong Kong. Uh, maybe Jody? Um, Jody here. Uh, unlike Davin, uh, I was born in Hong Kong, but I grew up in Canada, so exactly the opposite. Both Hong Kong and uh, Canada are two halves of my identity. So um, it's pretty devastating to see uh, one of your identities uh, feel like it's completely getting crushed under and suffocated under an authoritarian regime. Um, what we're seeing today is uh, the quashing of freedoms, the quashing of several liberties, uh, the breaking of promises on the part of uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Um, it's devastating because these people know and tasted freedom. That's why they're struggling and fighting and uh, for their lives, basically. And um, I would say what we can do in uh, overseas is uh, to learn about what's happening in Hong Kong, but also be very aware of what's happening here in Canada because Beijing's authoritarian overreach does not limit itself to Hong Kong. I fled Hong Kong to be here I don't want to flee Canada. And what I'm seeing is the infiltration and influence by uh, United Front uh, figures in, in, in Canada and uh, our elected officials. Today, it might be about Taiwan and Hong Kong and Tibet and uh, occupied East Turkestan. What is it going to be tomorrow? Democracy? Canada? Thank you, Jody. Yeah, I agree with you uh, that it is a constant struggle about where the line is drawn, and um, a lot of us in Canada perhaps are not aware of the uh, uh, implications of uh, Chinese influence overseas. And we'll go into that a little later uh, in the evening as well. Thank you. Uh, Mac, um, what is Hong Kong to you, and what do you think is happening there right now? Hai 
香港 under 中共嘅控制咁樣，你對你可能冇影響，咁可能你啲罪你會有呢，就好似 Jody 咁講，中晒。咁呢個 moment， 媽咪成日都覺得好擔心香港，因為我屋企係都仲有啲親人係喺香港嘅。咁但係媽咪同時都好慶幸，當年係做咗一個決定，呢、这個啱嘅決定啦。我覺得香港好似係病咗咁樣咯。即係好似有個 cancer 咁，而家上醫，但係問題是對抗緊呢個嘅 cancer， 即係中共係好重好重嘅無力感，因為我哋太遠啦。甚至乎我對住我係香港嘅朋友啦、香港嘅親人啦，大家傾開，究竟可以點樣令到香港好啲呢？有啲咩可以做呢？大家都覺得好似～做咩都好冇用，做咩都好似都唔得咁样。有阵时又觉得好攰，但系唔撑落去又觉得唔想放弃。即系有阵时点解话好似唔放弃系点解要走嗰个系我哋？点解唔可以医好佢呢？咁、嗯、有阵时每次谂翻起呢啲嘢都好灰心，但系同样地亦都要撑落去咯。因为咁，如果我哋都放弃咗嘅时候，咁喺香港嘅亲亲戚咧，香港嘅朋友咧，佢哋点咧？佢哋有阵时可能有啲人都系话啊，唔系唔想走，但系有冇咁嘅能力咧？甚至乎有啲系唔想生小朋友，就系、是、因为唔想好似出嚟受罪咁样咯，系好唔开心嘅一个 topic 咯。Thank you, Mac.、Uh, this is Derek again. So、uh, Mac was saying that、uh, they were somewhere in between、uh, David and Jody.、Uh, they were born in Hong Kong and grew up there as well,、uh, and、um, uh, moved with their family、uh, in anticipation,、uh, like Jody said,、uh, of '97 of what would, what what might happen,、uh, um, which turned out to be true:、uh, the、um, Chinese taking over and、um, encroaching on our liberties and. And、uh, civil rights, and、um, uh, when 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 Max's family first came here,、uh, the mom,、uh, their mother、uh, didn't really speak English, and it was a、uh, uh, English, and it was a、uh, when Max first came here, uh, 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 their family,、um, their mother didn't really speak English, and it was a really big struggle、um, uh, uh, together with、uh, their two sisters. But、uh, they decided to move here because、uh, it it is an option for for the children,、um, uh, even though. Even though '97 or whatever、uh, might not have uh, affected uh, the the I guess the older generation as much,、uh, at least、uh, the children would have option for a better life in in Canada. And、um, uh, they were just saying they think that Hong Kong is sick,、uh, as if as if、um, it had cancer,、uh, needs needs taken care of, needs curing, and、um, there's there's a constant. Sores,、uh, there's a constant sores or feeling of heavy helplessness,、um, uh, being so far away from from Hong Kong, and、um, uh, especially when talking to friends and family from from Hong Kong,、uh, that that feeling、uh, is especially、uh, apparent and strong. And、um, so, so the big struggle here is how do we improve the situation over here? And and it seems like whatever they do. Uh, um, things are、uh, not effective, or, or it's a it's a losing it's a losing fight. It's a constant struggle,、um, and and often there's a there's a really strong sense of tiredness, uh, helplessness, uh, almost、uh, hopelessness as well. And、um, but but they don't want to give up because、uh, because if it's if it if it's not if it's not us here、um, uh, uh, who who can say something, who can do something.、Um, Uh, then, then,、um, then who?、Uh, especially these days, with the、um, uh, with what's going on in Hong Kong, with the deteriorating situation there. Thank you. We're back live, Davy speaking. So, horror films often represent bigger social traumas or undercurrents of fears in society. Now, Derek. Um, what does Hong Kong horror do to address these real life concerns for you? Horror makes fear tangible. It puts a face to the ghost that haunts us. 
It allows us to address our fears in a fictional but also self-referential way. In this design exploration, you're seeing a playthrough of something like a video game through a first-person point of view, walking through classrooms, where in the middle there you can see there is a laptop that you're prompted to interact with. And once you interact with the laptop, then you'll be able to see that protest slogans will start playing and the color of the room will change. The lighting uses the green and red color palette emblematic of Hong Kong horror. And the changing classroom echoes images from the protests. The piled up desks that we can see behind here that are reminiscent of the barricades that, that the protesters put up on the streets. And this environment uh, changes every time you turn around, almost at an instant. And this environment also represents a infinite L-shaped loop of rooms that changes whenever you walk through the threshold. And in this second room, you'll see that it's a repeated prompt of the laptop. And once you interact with it, you hear and see another slogan or phrase. Here we see one country, two systems an empty promise that we will at a later date fit on the projection screen that you see here. The emptiness of the rooms alludes to the fact that the children of Hong Kong are the ones out on the streets. And here you can see that the piled up chairs are reminiscent of skyscrapers with airplanes, white miniature flying over them as a symbol of people, protesters, having to leave their homes, leave their homes behind because of what's going on in Hong Kong. And then in the, thir in the third room here, we see another lighting, a yellow light that represents the movement, the pro-democracy movement. And the slogan here, it says, if alive show us the person, if dead show us the body, it is a reaction to protesters disappearing or, or being suicided after being arrested by the police as you can see here with two empty files and uh, a metal desk representing that image and now in this last room it's a stark low light image of shadows of students standing in a line facing a wall we have put six here but perhaps we should have put 12 as a representation of the, t of the 12 student activists who were arrested on open seas while trying to flee from Hong Kong to Taiwan on a boat. And here, one of the very integral protest slogans, five demands, not one less. Watching a lot of those horror films in my research r reminded me that the Hong Kong that I grew up in, the language, the locations, all the cultural visual cues, and even down to the style of humor. The Hong Kong mm. that I remember is no longer there. So in a way you can say that I'm trying to preserve what I remember, transposing my experience of the place with elements borrowed from Hong Kong horror. So on July 1st, 2020, the Chinese government imposed the national security law in Hong Kong. According to the law, acts of secession, subversion, terrorism, and uh, even collusion with foreign entities or external forces are considered illegal. The language of the law itself is purposefully vague about what those acts are precisely. However, people have been arrested for as little as performing band anthems in Hong Kong, for example, Glory to Hong Kong, or even just uh, expressing their opinions on the internet. However, what is clear is that any acts committed in Hong Kong can be punishable in China, which is a very serious violation of the one country, two system principle uh, outlined in the Sino-British Joint Declaration uh, made in preparation of Hong Kong's 1997 handover back to Chinese rule. So this is the question for all three of you. So how has the law uh, changed the way you approach your activism or uh, affected your uh, how you take precautions. Um, maybe, uh, Jody, if you want to start. So I can tell you on the first day that it was enacted, uh, we're pretty shocked at how draconian it would be. Uh, it's even worse than our worst expectations. So 
the first thing I find myself doing is Googling whether or not Canada has an extradition treaty with Hong Kong and uh, whether my own safety is in jeopardy because of my activism here. Uh, the second thing I did, because I love to travel, is to figure out which other countries have extradition treaties with Hong Kong and or China. And was really devastated to find out that there were tons. Once I calmed down a bit, then I took serious measures to protect myself um, in terms of uh, uh, getting a burner phone, perhaps, and uh, looking at uh, other ways to protect my identity. Because um, we don't know whether or not the law is retroactive. And now we do. Uh, now we know that it is. Uh, so has it changed the way I do activism? Um, yes, in the way I conduct it. But it's not stopping me from voicing out because we're already much more privileged than the folks in Hong Kong. And um, if we are also afraid to speak out, um, then what says us about being in Canada? And um, I, I feel like we need to be that hope for our teammates in Hong Kong. And uh, I feel like uh, we, we have an even greater responsibility to speak up on behalf of them. Thank you, Jody. This is uh, Derek again here. And yeah, the self-censorship is is real. Um, uh, everybody, uh, anyone that I talk to who has any any ties to Hong Kong uh, since July 1st, since the law was enacted, um, uh, the self-censorship has been a very, very, very prominent uh, thought and topic, uh, regardless of how embedded they are in the activism. Um, profile pictures or even like what can we even talk about over text messages and um, and and things like that? It's uh, it's really unfortunately it it really sounds like stuff from fiction. Um, it, it's terrifying. Uh, so maybe uh, Mac, what the what do you think? How has the law changed the way you approach your activism and your precautions? Okay, so. 都會整咗個 burner 電話啊 ，numbers 啊，去 protect 自己嘅 ID 啊，做好多唔同嘅嘢啦。咁唔會停止我任何出嚟任何嘅一個活動啊，幫手啊，唔會停止嘅喎。因為咁，如果我哋都唔幫香港出聲，咁邊個可以幫佢哋咧？咁咪自己再小心啲，再包含啲，再遮得多啲咯。即係戴埋副眼鏡咁樣，即係你影乜都影唔到，唔會有任何可以 identify 到我自己嘅嘢咯。咁其實我 on top 都會更加小心係我自己同香港朋友嘅對話。It's not just only for 我自己嘅 protection， 係 for 佢哋嘅 protection too。我好記得喺個 national security law 出嚟嘅第二日，唔係第一日。我有個朋友，佢本身係香港，係開咗間餐廳，係 under 呢一個嘅黃色經濟圈。Immediately 佢 send 咗個 message 俾我，就話我要暫時 delete 曬同你哋啲 account， 唔可以同你哋有任何接觸，唔好 message 我住。因為佢哋誒黃色經濟圈個 group 嗰度俾人查緊，佢啲警察係 about to 去去鋪頭，話有個話個 admin 已經被拉咗，佢哋而家係等緊俾人查，咁去遲啲之後先至再 message 我。嗰、那個 moment 我係都幾即係唔會幾擔心佢嘅狀況。係佢哋 physically 係香港，甚至乎到而家有陣時，哦，因為平時自己都有陣時會同佢哋傾偈，會 send 啲 link show 俾佢哋睇，話哦，我哋有啲咩做，大家傾唔同嘅嘢。其實我而家都未必太敢去主動去同佢講呢啲嘢咯 ，unless 佢自己去同我傾話啊呢樣，因為我唔知道我究竟係咪 safe 去話呢啲資料俾佢聽，即係會唔會我 send 俾佢會令到佢有呢個嘅 trouble 咯。
，咁我會多咗呢一層嘅顧慮先咯。Thank you.、Uh, so this is Derek again, and、uh, Mac was saying that.、Uh, Like like Jody,、uh, they also、uh, have looked into or, or have used burner phones,、uh, um, or like、uh, covering themselves,、uh, wearing glasses,、uh, so that to make to make themselves a little harder to identify.、Um, but、uh, but that hasn't really stopped uh, their uh, involvement in the activism uh, because if uh, like mentioned before,、uh, we are privileged. To be able to speak up, to act over here.、Uh, if we don't do anything, then、uh, then we 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 owe we we.、Uh, it's our responsibility over here to to act,、uh, to do something for for those in Hong Kong. Especially, they were concerned uh, uh, in in conversations with their friends in Hong Kong. It's not just for their own safety, but also for their friends' safety,、uh, because we don't know what information is、uh, transmitted. Um, uh, whether consciously or subconsciously to them,、uh, for example,、uh, Mac has a friend in Hong Kong, uh, uh, a person, a restaurant owner, a restauranter, who's、um, very active in the、um, yellow economic circle,、um, uh, the, the pro-democracy economic circle. And、um, one day after the law was enacted in July 2020,、um, uh, Mac received a message saying,、uh, "I'm sorry." I, I'm deleting all of the conversations、uh, with you and, and all of your friends for, for for my own safety and and for everybody's safety. The police are actually investigating the、uh, the yellow economic circle and and everybody and to a point where、um, an administrator was arrested.、Uh, so their safety is uh, uh, become a really big concern. Uh, so uh, even now,、uh, especially now,、um, uh, Mac is a little more. Careful about sharing uh, uh, information or images of、uh, their activism over here with their friends in Hong Kong,、uh, in fear of、uh, inundating them with information that could be uh, perhaps uh, be politically valuable、uh, to be extracted from them. It's really difficult to think about when the other side is the one that gets to make up the rules、uh, and. And and gets to change them and enact them and inter- and interpret them however they want,、um, and it's it's just so obviously an unfair unfair game. Mabu, hi, hi. We're back live with、uh, Derek and I. It's Davy speaking. So. One of the things that I'm educating myself about the pro Hong Kong democratic movement, and also, you know, about、um, many of these different social change movements happening throughout these few years,、um, is the use of languages and codes that has been、um, used. For example, you know, by both oppressor and the press. So, for example, there's rioter versus protester, or some really specific codes have been made for social movements like. The ones that happened since the 2014 umbrella movement. Yeah, and that inspired the Cantonese lesson sections of the play, which you can see a demonstration here.、Mm. So controlling language is a very common tactic of oppressive regimes. Under the national security law, saying or displaying certain words or slogans in Hong Kong is considered an arrestable offense. So here are a few graphics from the unscripted team showing excerpts from the Cantonese lessons. This first one says "Yet Guang Lang Zai" in Cantonese. In English, that means、uh, "One Country, Two Systems," which I have defined as an empty promise. The second one here says in Cantonese "Guang Fu Hong Kong, Si Dai Gat Ming," which is a common protest term, which、uh, is often translated as "Liberate Hong Kong." Revolution of our times. It, nowadays, saying or displaying that phrase in public can get you arrested. Another example of an arrestable offense would be singing the equally illegal protest anthem, "Glory to Hong Kong." So, on this slide, on the left here, you can see an excerpt from the original lyrics. And on the right, what appears to be a random collection of numbers is actually a translated version. Cantonese is a tonal language, meaning the inflection of each word changes its meaning. For example, 
Ma and Ma means mom and horse, respectively. On the other hand, netizens have replaced the original illegal lyrics with numbers that have similar tonal values in response to the national security law. Let me demonstrate and read out the, uh, the lyrics here. So on the left, it says, and on the right, here comes the numbers. 0005-650-0042-0007-0008-0007-0008-0007-0008-0007-0008-0007-0008-0007-0008-0007-0008-0007-0008-0007-0008-0007-0008-0007-0008-0007-0008-0007-0008-0007-0008-0007-0008-0007
China can have uh, towards Canada. Um, it's basically uh, Canada sees itself as heavily dependent on China. And, and that's something that uh, it has been slowly eating away at our uh, social institutions without us knowing. And uh, so being able to, um, to remove that hand from our throat, so to speak, would uh, uh, be able to um, free Canada to uh, speak up more boldly. CSIS, our intelligence communities, have uh, told our universities that basically there's a national security uh, uh, national security issue with um, the transfer of dual-use technologies uh, to the People's Liberation Army. Because our three of our universities are in the top 10 university that's uh, co cooperating with the People's Liberation Army right now. And so the universities responded and said, that's not our role, that's the government's role to enact these policies to tell us what to do. So there are tons of these loopholes that um, uh, China has studied, the United Front has studied, and uh, is using to their advantage. Uh, so they've circumvented a lot of the times uh, federal um, authorities to um, be able to directly liaise with municipal or provincial powers and uh, who is a lot more trusting because they do not get these security briefings um, to, to sign contracts and, uh, and or uh, uh, increase the trade uh, between um, China and Canada and or, or do many things to, that is um, to bolster uh, their influence under Xi Jinping's plan. Thank you, Jody. Uh, this is Derek here again. Um, yeah, so with decades of planning and, uh, and I guess, scheming, uh, the Chinese influence over here is certainly wide and deep uh, through, through loopholes and different tactics. Um, Mac, do you, think, do, you think, uh, do you think there's a way out for Canada? Do you think, um, do you think the Chinese influence is in too deep now? Is there a way out for us? There's always a way of, of things if they're willing to get out of it. I guess it really depends on like if Canada wanted to get out or not, is what they think. Not that like it is a possible way or not. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. And, and, and yeah, what, what Mike was saying just now is that um, uh, if, like, like, like they said, if there's a will, there's a way. And uh, if after weighing the uh, advantages and disadvantages, um, uh, the Canadian government decided that um, these engagements are worth it, then, then I guess that's what they're doing. Hello. So we're back live, and this is Davey speaking. So what do you think, Derek? What, what, where do we look for, um, you know, when thinking about Hong Kong's future? Perhaps we can learn from our past this following piece we're going to share is called My Neighbor and the Dandelions. It is part of the story of a man who calls himself the new emperor of Kowloon. This piece is his reflection of his inaction during the 2014 Umbrella Movement, performed by Hiro Kanagawa as the new emperor of Kowloon. The music was composed during a workshop through my residency with the National Arts Center English Theater Department this past spring and summer accompanied by visuals created by the Unscripted team. Hmm. Come on, hit it! Mm. Around springtime in 2014, a new neighbor moved in across the street. His red-roofed mansion shot up within a week, an impressive expansion, a near-impossible feat. 
an absentee owner who showed up whenever he pleased, airing out the windows, pulling up weeds. Name's Winnie, by the way, because I like to win. The two of us mostly kept to ourselves. Every time he came back, he looked a bit different. Enough for me to notice, but not enough to say. Then came September. A little flower bloomed in my yard. Of all the things to say, my funny neighbor said to me, Dandelion is a weed, my friend. You'd better kill it before it spreads. He shook his fist in the air as he walked away in dismay. That's when something perplexing caught my eye. Hey, wait just a minute, I yelled across my yard. Where exactly did you get that watch? It looks just like mine. None of your damn business, he said. Not like it's one of a kind. Just keep those pesky weeds of yours in line or I'll whack them all next time. It was now mid-December and winter had finally arrived. My gold watch was nowhere to be seen, but my yellow dandelions thrived. My psoriasis was getting worse, like an old Chinese curse. I thought it was just an old wives' tale, thought it was just an ancient myth. He who dares renounce his blood shall be covered in fish scales. Seven for each ancestor he deserted, seventeen more every day. A pungent smell interrupted my skin relief routine. A toxic smog, an eye-watering fog. My neighbor wearing my off-white linen shirt, spewing red poison all over my garden, prancing on my dandelions with gleeful abandon. In that moment, I did what any reasonable man would. Instead of chasing off the lunatic, I shut my window and left him to his deeds. I don't know why, but that was my tactic. I stood by and let him do whatever he pleased. I stood by and did nothing at all. I did nothing and damn, he was pleased. One by one I watched my precious flowers wither, thinking how next time I would just do better. 79 days my fellow flowers thrived. Then came winter and the dandelions died. Maybe just thinking was where it all went wrong. Thinking of a field of dandelions gone. We are, we are almost out of time here, and uh, I know that all of you are really busy people and, and do many, many things and live many lives, many important lives. So um, I just want to maybe get one more thing from, from all of you for our audience here. So if each of you can leave our audience with one action they can take right now, what would it be? Um. One of the goals that we should try to reach or achieve is to curb um, CCP's growing economic power. One of the most basic and easiest thing is to do uh, is to look at like what products are using, where are they made in, and also to check on your politicians, like their um, interaction with the CCP, and also to see um, maybe um, how are you supporting local businesses as well. What about you, Jody? I would say awareness is the start. There are tons of reporters you can read up on. Um, people like Sam Cooper, people like uh, Jeremy Natal, uh, people like Stephen Chase are doing the heavy lifting of investigating um, what is happening here. By being attuned to those things, uh, you can help stand up and guard our democracy uh, and guard our, uh, our institutions. And that will reduce the risk that us as activists are taking here. As activists, um, do you want more people to show up to, to public protests and events? And if so, where do they find this information? We definitely want more people to show up to uh, events, but I think it would be immensely helpful for people to be more educated. Being able to speak to the foreign interference and influence is uh, 
as uh, someone of uh, as someone that is not a Hong Konger is way more powerful, and uh, then we can have more allies speaking up against this uh, and be able to distinguish that CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is not the Chinese people, and that we are we can definitely speak out against. Uh, what the CCP is doing, and it is not racist. Like we're having such a hard time of people uh, uh, just afraid of saying the wrong thing because they're like, oh, there's so much discrimination against Asians. Yes, we need to acknowledge the um, anti-Asian discrimination, but we uh, also need to recognize that um, there are people being oppressed by the Chinese Communist Party and by not speaking up against that because they're afraid of being racist, then they're leaving uh, the marginalized uh, to bleed and dry. I think I just want to uh, add on with a quote that I have learned from um, my former professor, uh, Professor Benny Tai, who was fired from Hong Kong U. I remember um, I did a podcast with him and um, he uh, like, we basically um, discuss it, um, how academics and also activism work together. And I remember Professor Benny Tai um, talk about real mobilization comes from knowledge. And it is so important to suit ourselves up when we really want to uh, bring real substantial mobilization. And yeah, and especially what Jody just mentioned about um, the false, the misconception and misconception of the correlation between racism and supporting Hong Kong. This misconception has been abused by the CCP in trying to silence um, um, support supporting voices um, overseas. So, right. Thank you. It's Derek here again. So yes, it is. Education is important, and it's important to distinguish between. Uh, what we are against, we're against the policies, we're against the, um, the, the policy makers, but we're not against the, the people um, uh, in, in general. Uh, Mac, I want to hear from you as well. Um, if there's anything, one thing you can leave the audience with, one action, what would it be? Not just care about themselves, care about others. The people, not just only the people beside you, maybe your neighbor, start with your neighborhood, start with your coworker, and then start looking around the world, your community. Not just looking after yourself, that like, I'm good in my little circle, in my comfort zone, I'm good. I don't need to care about the world. No, it is not. It's not just about you. It's about the whole world. It's about, it's about everyone. Thank you. That's a very, very good reminder, especially these days when we are often so isolated from everybody because we have to. Um, yeah. Thank you to all three of you for your time and your thoughts and your wisdom and your compassion. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're back live with Dave and Derek and it's Davey speaking. Our broadcast might be done, but the conversation isn't. Uh, we'll be keeping the hashtag yellow objects channel going because the conversation is going to keep going to this telegram channel that we made for you. T.me slash yellow objects. Yellow is spelled with a three and seven E and objects is spelled with a zero and seven O. So that's T.me slash yellow objects. And we'll send you the link after this broadcast. And um, because we want to hear from you. What support do you think local Hong Kong uh, folks need to keep more moving forward? What are your feelings right now about what's happening in Hong Kong? And what images, ideas, and concepts did you find inspiring? Also, all the folks that are watching tonight's broadcast will be getting a survey, and we welcome all feedback, so thank you. And so the journey continues. Keep an eye out for Yellow Objects in May 2021 for the full production by Rice and Beans Theatre in collaboration with Playwrights Theatre Centre at the Fire Hall. Once again, a big thank you to our panelists for their time and insight, and thank you to the PTC team for all of their work. And thank you all for joining us at home.
I'm Derek Chan. And I'm Davy Samuel Calderon. Pa'alam and good night. And this has been Unscripted Yellow Objects. Guang for Hong Kong, Si Doi Gat Ming. Good night. Cast Co host, director, Derek Chan. Co host, producer, Davy Samuel Calderon. Emperor, hero, Kanagawa. Dramaturg, Heidi Taylor. Speakers, Davin Wong, Jody Chan, Mac. Crew. Digital Dissemination Coordinator and DOP, Chase Paget. Technical Coordinator, T Artist. Assistant Camera and Technical Operator, Anthony Kit Lee. Designers, Artists 12345, Composer, Derek Chan, Snake Pliskin, Shizuka Kai, T Artist. Chat Moderators, Howie D, Anthony James, Low Vision Consultant, Christy Cassie. PTC Staff, Belinda Bruce, Joanna Garfinkel, Melanie Yates. Thank you. This project has been made possible in part by the Government of Canada. Ce projet a été rendu possible en partie grâce au gouvernement du Canada. PTC would like to thank Canadian Heritage, Canada Council for the Arts, and BC Arts Council. We acknowledge the financial support of the province of British Columbia, produced with the cooperation of the Union of BC Performers. For Yellow Objects, Derek would like to thank the Canada Council for the Arts, BCAC, Province of BC, City of Vancouver, PTC, VACT, the National Arts Centre English Theatre Artists in Residence Program, and Rice and Beans Theatre. The Playwright acknowledges the assistance of the 2020 Banff Playwrights Lab, a partnership between the Banff Centre for Arts and Creativity and the Canada Council for the Arts. The NEC English Artists in Residence Program is made possible with the assistance of the Canada Council for the Arts. Thanks for coming.